But now that you've gotten comfortable, I won't ask you to stand again today. But today I want you to, well, you don't have to. You're, you're good. Stay seated. Stay seated. It's okay. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord this morning. And I want you just to really concentrate on that. Listen. In fact, I might even invite you to, if, if you choose to, just to go ahead and close your eyes. We'll have the, the uh, verses on the screen, of course. But sometimes, you know, it helps, I think, to get back into that first century mindset where you have to listen, where you can only hear the word meant to be spoken then and now. So hear this reading from Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 1 through 11. Paul writes, Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from his love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others, too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Most merciful God, we come this morning with hearts, hearts open to you. Not just the word spoken, but the word which has existed with God and as God from the beginning, from before the beginning, throughout eternity. Word made flesh whom we celebrate not only at Christmas time, but with every breath that you have given us as the Lord, maker of heaven and earth, creator of all life, the one who sustains us, the one who inspires us with the very breath of life given by your spirit. Lord, let us hear now. Let us receive what you would speak now. Let us receive the light and the life that you alone not only give, but that you alone are now, Lord. And may we be changed as we receive you. In the name, above all names, the name that you have exalted above all men, above all angels, in the name of Jesus the Christ, we ask it. Amen. 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 I tell you to be seated, but you're already there. It's all right. It's good. <laughs> well, Merry Christmas, everybody. I know some of you right now, you're saying, Ben, that was Friday. Move on. Get over it. And it's, it's, it's interesting to me how we think of these things because, you know, um, some of us in this room and some of us joining us online, you've already put the tree outside or, or, or put it back in the attic, depending on what kind of tree you have. You've taken down the lights. The stockings are tucked away. You've taken your Marty Moose commemorative eggnog glasses from Christmas vacation, and you've stored those carefully back in the attic. But others, your house still looks like this. Maybe more of you look like this, right? And, and I want to encourage you, I'm not trying to shame or guilt anybody who's already packed Christmas away, but, uh, but you know, Christmas in the church, it really is not just one day, it is 12 days. 
We, that song we all love to hate just didn't come out of nowhere. It really is a real thing. This, this 12 days from December 25th to Epiphany, which is January 6th, 12 days to, to contemplate and think about and focus on this gift, this mystery that is the incarnation, the word made flesh. And I don't know about you, but I, I need way more than just 12 days to really even try to get my mind, my heart wrapped around what the gift and the mystery of Christ born in Bethlehem, what that really means. And so what I'd like us to do, though, just to make sure we're all focused, we're all tracking together. Today, if you're doing your math, what day is it? The third day of Christmas? Is that right? Okay, I'm going to test you now. Let's start, we're not going to go through the whole song, but we're going to do it the very end backwards. Let's start with day 12. Everybody remember what that truly psychotic, uh, true love of yours gave you on day 12? I say psychotic because with that much poultry and fowl and musicians, and that'd be just a train wreck in anybody's house, wouldn't it? So, all right, so 12 drummers drumming, right? Okay, so let's start there. We're going to work our way all the way back down to what's, what's the first day? Partridge in a pear tree, right? Anybody seen one of those lately? No, of course you haven't. So, all right, 12 drummers drumming. You have, on the 12th day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Ready? 12 drummers drumming, 11 Piping ten, lords are leaping nine, ladies dancing eight, maids are milky seven, swans are swimming six, here it is, five golden rings, perfect, ready, four calling birds, three French hens, two turtle doves, and a partridge in a pear tree, beautiful, you guys give yourselves a hand, that was impressive, you didn't know you knew all 12 of those, did you? Yeah, but when we think about this and we, we talk about Christmas, and, and I know, you know, some are ready to move on, some just get things packed away and want an organized house, and I get that, but you know, this year too, there have been some folks, many folks, many of us, who've found this to be, as Elvis would say, a blue Christmas, right, in a really true and impactful way. And I've had people say to me all throughout Advent, those four weeks leading up to Christmas, they've said, Ben, you know, I, I just, I can't get into Christmas this year. It's, it's too, too depressing. I'm not going to be with my family. Uh, we can't do all the things we, we would normally do with, with Christmas concerts and all of these things. And I've had so many people say that. And, uh, you know, they've said Christmas just really isn't made for people who are depressed, people who are lonely, people who are hurting, people who are feeling, even though we know we're not, but still feeling hopeless. Lord, have mercy. That's exactly who Christmas is for. Do you know that? Amen. Do you know that? Everything we've sung so far today, everything that the scriptures have to teach us about why the incarnation, why the son would come and would lower himself, so to speak. And that's what we're going to talk about today, poured out love. Why he would, as Paul says, and we'll talk more about this, why the son would empty himself, pour himself out to be born in the form of a human, even lower in the form of a slave. Why would he go that far? Why would he enter into our mess, our misery, which has been far worse in human history than what we're facing in 2020, I assure you. And so as we think about this, Christmas is absolutely for everybody. It's absolutely for the lonely, the, 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 the tired, the broken, the, the poor, the, the, the isolated, those who feel they have no hope. That's why we need to understand Christmas isn't made for just one day. It's made for 12. And there's a quote I want to share with you from a writer by the name of Bobby Gross. And he says it this way, and I love it. I want to share it with you on the screen. He says that Christmas, not just the single day, but the festival of 12 days, offers us anew this gift and draws us again into this mystery. Word become flesh. Creator turned creature. Immensity contained, fullness poured out, power made vulnerable, eternity subject to time, all this self-giving by God, for what reason? For our sakes, a gift 
immeasurable, a love incomprehensible. Isn't that beautiful? I mean, any one of those phrases, word became flesh, creator turned creature, immensity contained, fullness poured out, power made vulnerable, eternity subject to time, all of this self-giving by God. And we remember in this image right here, which I'm sure you've seen in nativity scenes all over the city, maybe you have two or three in your own home, the mystery, the wonder, the gift that is this Human child lying in a feed trough for livestock. It doesn't get any rawer than that. It doesn't get any more homespun, rustic, whatever you want to call it. Before any of that was cool and hip and chic, it was just how the poor people lived. Light of the world, you stepped out into darkness Open my eyes, let me see, let me see this for what it is, for who he is. That's the wonder of this season, this gift, this mystery, this love, as Bobby Gross says, immeasurable, incomprehensible. But it's meant to be more than just the beauty of candles and and the light that we share this time of season, uh, this time of the year I should say, it's so much more about that it's all the ways that God could have done it, think about this, all the ways God could have provided his greatest self revelation to humankind of all the ways God could have made God's presence known that ways that we would have done it, bigger louder, more grandiose, more smoke, more lights, more noise get the best artist you can to sing at this thing, all of this stuff, all the ways God would have chosen, could have chosen chosen to show how God is with us and this is the way God does it. Don't let another day of Christmas pass by without spending some time marveling at that truth. I mean, what was God thinking? Well, Paul tells us, doesn't he? We just heard it. Paul's letter to the Philippians chapter 2. Remember, he tells us what was in the mind of Christ. Back to verse 5, if you're with me. We're going to come back to 1 through 4 here in a little bit. But we're going to pick up right in the middle of the passage we just read from Philippians 2, verse 5. Paul says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. And the older translations, which, which translate it better, in my opinion, than the New Living Translation. That's the one I'm reading right now. The older translation said, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And he's speaking to the church, obviously, in Philippi. So we can take this individually, but collectively as well. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. And he goes on, verse 6, though he was in the form of God. Now, what does the word form mean? We have to think about this clearly. To be in the form of God. Remember, Paul was an educated man, and as he is talking to a Hellenistic society, Greek philosophy permeates so much of the thought and language of the day. To be in the form of something means to possess the characteristics, the traits, the nature, the essence of that thing. In other words, as we would say it today in Tennessee, to say you are in the form of God means to say you is God. To contain the essence, though he was in the form of God, he did not think of equality with God. He did not think of of the power, the privileges that came with his divinity as something to cling to, as something to seize, as something to grab and hold on to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. Not his divinity. He can't lose what he is in essence, but he gave up his privileges. He gave up his rights, you might say. The word there in the Greek is that he emptied himself, poured himself out voluntarily, choosing this way. He took the humble 
position of a slave, born in the form of a human being. So look at this. If Christ, in the form of God, empties himself into the form of a human, like you and I, Remember what form means, having the characteristics, the traits, the essence. It really is the thing it says it is. So he is not only fully God, fully divine, he is also as human as you or I. Don't forget that. And even more, not only that essence, but then to take the identity of a slave. This isn't far enough to go, apparently, according to God. But to lower himself, to pour himself out even of the essence of his humanity to become even in the lowest rank of human existence. How far is he willing to go? Have you ever asked yourself that question? This is the wonder. This is the mystery of our faith. This is what makes Christianity so unique. This is what makes Christ so unique. appeared in human form, humbled himself in obedience to God, the form of God, the form of a human being. Remember what we see when we talk about the form of God. Remember what the writers of the Hebrews said, chapter one, he said that he was the exact imprint, the very character of God. He radiates the glory of God. In other words, when you look at Jesus, you see what God looks like. And it's not just about physical appearance or any of that. What it is, is about the way God is. How God loves. What we see in Christ in human form is all of this put into action in how we are to not only love God, but love one another. You remember how he does that? Do you remember? What does he do? We've already seen how the eternal son pours himself out, empties himself willingly, lovingly, never giving up his divinity and yet surrendering all that was rightfully his in order to come to you, to me, no matter where we are, no matter what we're experiencing. And then do you remember what he does? When Jesus wants to demonstrate how we are to love one another, he doesn't just tell us. He doesn't sit on a golden throne and say, now do as I say, mere subject. What does he do? That night, that last night with his disciples before he was given over, betrayed, abandoned, murdered. He puts on a towel wrapped around his waist, the one who has poured himself out and he gets on his knees and he washes the feet of those men who over the next 12 hours would all run and hide, abandon him. That's what love looks like. Poured himself out. You want to know what real love looks like according to Jesus? You wash feet. Not looking for someone to wash your feet in return. Not expecting people to love you back. He poured himself out to be born in the manger. He poured himself out all throughout his life in teaching, in healing, in walking, in trying to help us understand what does it look like to love one another in right relationship with God and each other. He poured himself out at the Last Supper and in that last gathering with his disciples saying, now do, go and do as I have done. Love one another as I have loved you. And then lastly, what does Paul tell us? He poured himself out upon the cross humble, 
Verse eight, he humbled himself in obedience to God and even died a criminal's death on a cross. In other words, he died the death of a slave. That's how far love took Christ. So stop and consider now for a moment. This is a lot to put into a message at Christmas, I know. But we need to understand this. The love of God poured out in Christ led him to embrace vulnerability, to embrace weakness for our sake, for our salvation. And in his vulnerability, we are not only shown what real love looks like, we are actually saved by it. In all the warmth and fuzziness of Christmas, don't forget our need for a Savior. Don't forget how desperately we need him. And if 2020 hasn't shown you that, I don't know what else can. We woke up Christmas morning, some of us literally, to that explosion on 2nd Avenue downtown. And it seems like almost every time we get just a leg up a little bit this year to start feeling a little bit more positive, a little bit more hopeful, like there's light at the end of the tunnel, then something happens that just smacks us right back down. But that's the same way it was in the first century for so many of the most vulnerable, of the most oppressed, of the most hopeless And those are the ones to which Christ came. And those are the ones to which he still comes today. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel, his good news is peace. Chains shall he break. Why? For the slave is still our brother. And in his name, all oppression shall cease. Turn with me to verse, or uh, Galatians chapter four, if you're following along very quickly. You need to understand this, the way Paul phrases it elsewhere. Galatians four, beginning with verse four, Paul says, but when the time was right, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law, God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. If you've ever wondered, well, I'm not a slave. Are you so sure? To be enslaved to sin. You may have never seen yourself as slave under the law as ancient Israel Chains shall he break for the slave. That means you and me. He's our brother. And in his name, all oppression shall cease. God sent him, verse 5 again, Galatians 4. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law so that he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out Abba, Father. Abba means daddy in Aramaic. Now you are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you are his child, God has made you his heir. So stop and think about this. Here is the gospel. Here is the good news, my friends, that even though he was in the form of God, he saw it not as something to hold on to, not as something to stand on his rights and say, this is who I am and what I have and what I can do. No, he emptied himself, poured all of that out. So why? So that he could take the form of a human like you and like I, to know what it is to hurt, to know what it is to lose, to know what it is to grieve, to sweat, to hunger, to thirst, to desire, to know what it is to go through all that being human means. Because in that, taking the form of a human being, even the form of a slave, he would come to a place to meet us on our own level. Why? Not so that we could just fall on our face and worship him as much as we should do that, but so that he would take in and through his own death not only be exalted by the Father, which we'll talk about here in a moment, 
but to take us out of slavery and make us children of God, his brothers and sisters. You need to understand this. Back to Philippians chapter two. This is so important. Verse nine, therefore, because of his obedience through his death upon the cross, the thing that, that Jesus wouldn't hang on to, the thing that he would not cling to, that he would not seize for himself, the, the glory of being who he was at the right hand of God the Father, who he was in all of his privileges, of his, of his divinity, that thing that he let go of in humility that he completely surrendered and he poured out, all for love's sake he became poor, as we sang earlier. Because of that, what does God the Father do? Elevates him, exalts him, puts him back at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, the place of highest glory, highest honor. That's a beautiful thing, isn't it? What Christ had every right to cling to, he released in his humility, and God gives it back to him. Do we do that? How many things are we as Christians fighting for right now with the tools and the weapons of this world? And in the form of a slave, Jesus is over here on his knees washing feet. This doesn't make any sense to us. This doesn't make any sense to the world. What was God thinking? Everybody loves a baby. Everybody loves to talk about sweet little baby Jesus child born in the manger and he's so cute and he's cuddly and he's adorable and everybody gets caught up in the sentimentality of that and everybody, nobody has a problem with that. But what God began in that birth and he carries out through the life and the ministry and the mission and the death in the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, now we're starting to flip things upside down. Now we're starting to mess with what we think is reality. Now we're starting to mess with what we think is actually truth. Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all other names. Verse 10, Paul writes, at that name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. That means the living, the dead. That means heavenly, earthly creatures, everything. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Why? To the glory of God the Father. I need to wrap this up for today. But I need you to understand something. We do not understand <laughs> this kind of love as human beings on our own. This is love that has to be revealed to us. Just like Christ had to be revealed to us. God had to be revealed to us in and through the one who is fully divine, fully human. The one who is Jesus the Christ. What is freedom to you? I'll ask this question when I've taught ethics in the past, and, and almost always we get the typical American answer. Eventually people say, you know, freedom is our number one value, and freedom means choice. I get to choose. Choose where I go, choose what I do, choose what I wear, choose who I vote for, choose, 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 choose. I want to challenge you this Christmas. Is that how the Bible defines freedom? Because what does Paul say? Remember I told you we go back to verses 1 through 4? Philippians chapter 2. So Paul has just explained, let that same mind that was in Christ be in you. This mind. The mind that understood what it meant to pour out, to self-empty. Taking the form of a human, the form of a slave. To lay down one's life 
for another in love, to wash each other's feet. Remember what Paul says. Only with that can we answer these questions in the affirmative. What Paul said to the early church in Philippi, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? We are encouraged if we are belonging to Christ, if we understand this, if the same mind of Christ is in us. Otherwise, you're given up to despair. The number of Christians right now that are, that are drowning in despair, it's overwhelming in our culture because they're seeing a lot of things die that necessarily aren't in alignment with what Jesus said we're supposed to expect as his followers. And they're grieving. But we have to have the same mind of Christ to see that for what it is. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Is there any comfort from his love? Are we comforted by his love or are we comforted by our stuff? Are we comforted by our own schedules, our own choices, our own desire to do what we want to do when we want to do it? Because by God, that makes us good, I mean Americans. Are we comforted by his love? Even in the midst of uncertainty? Even in the midst of hardship? Do you realize Paul wrote this from prison? This may have been the third time, at least, that he was in prison. This time may have been the last time. He wrote this in 60 AD. He talks about joy and rejoicing 16 times in four chapters, one of his shortest letters. Dude was nuts. He's in prison. And it wasn't a matter of, I know exactly when I'm going to serve my sentence and when I'll get out and what. The, no, he had no idea when or if he'd be released. But there's comfort from his love. Is there any fellowship together in the spirit? Now he's talking about unity in the church. We should, Lord, have mercy, do we need that? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing. He actually says, make my joy complete. That's a better translation. Make my joy complete by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one mind and one purpose. Which one? This one. The same mind that was in Christ Jesus. And he spells it out in case you're dense like me and you need even more details and you need even more laid out there. Verse three, don't be selfish. Don't be selfish. I'm gonna say it again. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. I know we live in a selfie culture where selfie culture has become normal, where everybody wants to post. I'm so humbled to have won this award that nobody else would tell you about, so I will. No, no, that's a trap. And I'm not trying to hurt anybody's feelings or, 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 or I'm not trying to do that, but, but it's, I, I, I say that because I, because I love you. It's a trap because we become inwardly focused. We're, we're not thinking about others. We're thinking about, I, I need this attention. I need to bring attention to this so that someone will recognize me, recognize me, recognize me. And we try to do that in our own strength. And it's a trap that the, the enemy will use against us. That's why Paul says, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Let God do that. Let God shout your praises. Let God bring you recognition. He will. And besides, if we're doing this right, church, we should be looking to encourage and raise up and recognize each other. Be humble, Paul says, verse three. Thinking of others as better than yourselves. And don't look out for your own interests, but take interests, interests, I should say, in others. Man, we used to think about this at Christmas time where we'd put other people ahead of ourselves and it was about who is in need and, and who needs help. And, and I thank God, as Christ Church, this is a generous church that provides so much for so many and gives so freely. Thank God for that. But even more importantly than what we do with our material resources or what we do with, with money or, or gifts or anything of that sort, what about our hearts? Do we put others before ourselves? Do we deny ourselves in the way Christ shows us how to? Not, to? not to put yourself down, not to say you're the scum of the earth. God doesn't say that about you. Jesus doesn't say that about you. No. But to recognize that the true joy, true freedom comes from living in the same mind which Christ had.
in his freedom, true freedom. This is what freedom is. Being able to walk in the love of God, being able to walk in humble obedience of God. That's what real freedom is. Freedom is not just doing what you want, when you want, how you want. Freedom is being freed from slavery to sin, slavery to self, so that we might be children of God who can love in the way that Jesus has first loved us. That's what freedom is. It is for freedom that we have been set free. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Y'all can quote those verses, but this is what it means. The world says, that's not freedom. Washing feet, doing things for people that we pay people $8 an hour to do. I mean, for real. When's the last time you honored somebody in housekeeping? God does. When's the last time you honored that person that comes and cuts your grass? You don't even know his name. God does. When's the last time you honored someone who literally just got off the boat or the plane last week and has been set down in the middle of this city, has no idea what it means to be a Southerner, has no idea what it means to be an American. But they're here. God honors that person. All these ways that we think glory and honor, power and might are meant to come, meant to be experienced. Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the generous act of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by his poverty, by his being poured out, you might become rich. We know Christ is our Lord and our Savior. I mean, we say we do. But do you know him as your example? Not that we're divine, we're not, and we know that. <laughs> he is unique, he is distinct in so many ways. And thank God that he is. He wouldn't be our Savior if he wasn't. But Jesus said, the master, he said, the student is not greater than the master. Do as I have done. Love one another as I have loved you. 